thank you, Yuta, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, attending this session. So uh, let me start with a little story. Um, six or seven years ago, hold on, I, I need to be able to go to the next slide. Here we go. Uh, six or seven years ago, I was uh, directing a large application development project um, of about 35,000 mandates um, in agile development. And I wanted to have a conversation with my engineers on how to best leverage NoSQL technology. And specifically, how to best denormalize since all of the developers were coming from an RDBMS background. And I thought that doing this, um, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, and for that, an entity relationship diagram would be the best tool. Except that with the traditional tools uh, for data modeling uh, of relational databases, they would not render JSON structures um, in a user-friendly manner. They would insist on making every substructure of a JSON document a separate box in the entity relationship diagram. And I thought that that was not the most intuitive way of representing uh, the information. So I thought that um, having two different views of the information uh, would make a lot of sense. The first one was by keeping the entire JSON a document in a single atomic unit of the entity relationship diagram. And the other one was with uh, having a tree view, a hierarchical tree view that makes it much easier to manipulate uh, the JSON structure. So, uh, you know, with a traditional tool, um, if you did the reverse engineering of a single MongoDB collection with some hierarchical data, you would end up with this whole bunch of uh, disorganized boxes um, in the entity relationship diagram um, when I thought that it would make much more sense to have it uh, in a way that more resembled the physical structure uh, of the JSON document. So, um, since I was not finding uh, on the market the tool that would satisfy my needs, I was crazy enough to have a prototype build, um, and I presented it as a, at a conference um, in the U.S. Um, five years ago. Um, and in the, uh, one of the attendees thought that uh, this was a very promising uh, approach. And um, if he convinced me to make it a product, and if we released it, they would be our first customer. And this guy was the chief data architect at eBay in San Jose. And so we finished the product, uh, made an, a you know, minimum viable product version 1.0, and they did become our first customer. And we went from there to sell to uh, now many Fortune 500 companies um, and US government agencies. So it is a commercial product uh, because I bootstrapped the startup. Um, but I, I must say for this audience that, you know, we have an, uh, an academic program which provides free licenses to faculty, staff, and students for educational programs and research, and so you're welcome to apply for it. The tool works now. Uh, it was originally built for MongoDB, and then uh, eBay convinced us to, uh, build, to continue uh, adding different targets, specifically for them was Cassandra and Couchbase, and then American Express convinced us to do Neo4j, and now we have this um, tool that is able to um, handle a variety of modern technologies for data at rest and data in motion. Uh, so not just NoSQL databases, but also JSON in relational databases and REST APIs and a whole bunch of big data related technologies. 
So enough talk about us. Uh, the rest of the talk is uh, purely vendor, vendor neutral. Um, and um, it, it is about sharing our experience of what our customers are, uh, are experiencing in the, uh, you know, using um, data modeling or doing data modeling for NoSQL. Uh, in a variety of industries. So that's what the talk is about. And um, I encourage you to ask questions in the chat, um, but I'll go through the whole presentation and then we'll handle, we'll have probably 15 minutes uh, to do question and answers at the end. So um, this is a conceptual modeling conference. So I think it's important to talk about the state of the industry. Because um, if you didn't notice, data modeling is under pressure. Part of it is self-inflicted, I think. Part of it is due to uh, being associated with bottlenecks in requirements uh, definition. Part of it is due to misinterpretation of concepts such as agile development. Um, and part of it is due, um, of, uh, due to the schema-less nature of NoSQL. Um, so, you know, I, you'll see I have a bunch of cartoons uh, during the presentation. There, there is a perception, right or wrong, that data modeling is a bottleneck. So, you know, obviously this is a caricature, but some people uh, have had the tendency to want to create a complete enterprise model before anything can get done um, in IT. And that's obviously not a very agile uh, way of doing things. Um, at the same time, requirements uh, gathering and data modeling uh, also need to be pragmatic. To be relevant, um, you know, data modelers, uh, data modeling cannot be just a lab exercise. It needs to help solve real, uh, real world problems directly. And um, in the, you know, putting the, uh, the context of agile development, um, you know, there is a perception, um, again, right or wrong, that data modeling is in the way of getting things done. So don't get me wrong. At Hackolade, we love agile. Uh, we ship new versions of the software almost every single week. Uh, in order to create value quickly for customers. And the tool has grown from a minimum viable product four and a half years ago to now a mature enterprise uh, software. Um, but the problem is that agile principles are either misinterpreted or deliberately used as an excuse for uh, sloppiness. And um, I'll let you read the cartoon um, you know, it, it's a classic, of course, on how Agile is being introduced uh, in enterprises without any training and with a complete misinterpretation of what it really means. The problem with that is that after a while, uh, companies may feel disappointed by Agile um, initiatives and um, you know, th this can lead to headlines like we see here out of Forbes magazine, where, for example, the U.S. Department of Defense, which had committed to agile meth methods 15 years ago, now realizes that um, the, the so-called agile projects are not being in implemented according to the real principles of agile. And that hinders um, the, its execution capabilities. So usually when I'm in front of an audience, I ask how many people uh, who are doing Agile actually have read the Agile manifesto. Uh, it's difficult to poll the audience uh, online, but basically it it's usually comes to about 20% uh, of the people who have actually uh, read it. And I'd like, I usually like to remind people that the authors of the manifesto did not at all endorse the lack of doing things, uh, the lack of doing things right. Actually, 
They just wanted to restore balance, but they do embrace modeling, documentation, and planning. They just wanted to put a nuance that those shouldn't be done for the sake of them. So don't do, uh, the end game is not the enterprise model or the documentation. The end game is delivering software uh, quickly to customers so it can add value. So I'm not going to read the manifesto, uh, here it is, but the point is that the right hand side that is in uh, italics um, here um, remains important, but is not as important as uh, doing the left side. But nowhere in the manifesto did anybody say that you shouldn't do the stuff on the right side. Okay, so uh, there are 12 principles. I'm not gonna uh, go through them either, but uh, you see that they're advocating doing things right. Uh, good design, architecture, requirements, all of those things are still necessary. And you see here, um, if anybody tells you otherwise, that the Agile Manifesto people did not want to create an excuse to do things quick and dirty. Um, they just wanted to do things right and ship software as soon as possible to customers. So that's for Agile. When it comes uh, to NoSQL, uh, which was also a contributor to the fact that data modeling uh, is under pressure, um, well, everyone thinks that they're an expert because JSON seems easy to understand. And, uh, you know, you hear about how you need to fail fast. So let's, uh, let's program first and think after. Um, you know, uh, developers think that they can design their schemas um, at their desk without talking to the business, without uh, talking to architects without um, interacting with DBAs, and that doesn't lead to uh, you know something that makes much sense. It, it, in effect, what happens is they code first, and then they present it to people, and they figure out that that was not what was needed, and they go back and redo things over and over, and that's not uh, very productive. So. This is not helped by the database vendors of NoSQL because these people want to make it look so easy to download their product, develop the application, and think about the data model afterwards. Um, and you see that in this slide, um, you know, some people suggest that it should be done that way, which creates uh, a lot of rework um, and it's in the end, for a large company doing you know, thousands and thousands of man days of, um, of uh, development, this is a disaster for productivity, uh, for total cost of ownership, and for uh, data governance. Um, I had once a building contractor tell me that, um, you know, he said, I don't need an architect. I have the blueprint in my head and that's all I need to build a house. Uh, well, you know, large organizations are, have found the limits of this approach and they're discovering that, you know, there is another way that things can be done. Um, in particular, uh, some executives may be uh, quite disappointed by um, the return on investment of their uh, big data uh, investments of the, uh, of the last few years. And when you talk to data scientists, you figure out you know, that data, scientists, uh, data science, which is supposed to be one of the sexiest jobs uh, of the 21st century, actually the data scientists themselves complain that they're more data janitors and that they spend the majority of their time um, fixing data, cleaning it up um, after it's been stored in order to spend a minority of their time actually interpreting the data or misinterpreting it in the, in the case of this quote. 
Um, and I think that this is um, a really a, a big missed opportunity. So hope. So thankfully, um, there are people who are preaching um, the right uh, message, and um, I'm giving here the example of. Uh, someone from LinkedIn who wrote a big, thick book on designing data-intensive application, recognizing from uh, chapter two already, uh, chapter two is entirely on data models, uh, and it's again in uh, chapters later on in the book, but um, it, it turns out that despite what you read on the internet, uh, which may be written by you know, bloggers of uh, very small uh, Silicon Valley startup, the actually the big uh, successful companies on the web, uh, the Google, the Facebook, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Yahoo, and, and so on, these people, as proved by, you know, a lot of the research, uh, you know, from people who are uh, in the attendance uh, today, that, um, big companies do data modeling and they do it for NoSQL um, as well. And they do that because it's a good practice that pays off. So when you read on, on the web, some people who say data, NoSQL databases are schema-less, therefore you shouldn't be uh, designing your your schema, or you should we're an agile, and therefore you don't need to do data modeling. There is actually research and literature that uh, counter uh, those practices, and they preach the right way of doing things. Okay, but good practices are not sufficient. So. Um, you know, to, uh, to avoid this kind of situation, um, you know, as shown earlier, um, where maybe there's a perception that uh, requirements gathering and uh, data modeling become a bottleneck to um, agile development. Um, I think that, you know, there, there's also more than needs to be done. And uh, that's in the area of fine tuning data modeling. Um, I wrote a provocative article um, a few years ago on dataversity, uh, which was titled, uh, Data Modeling is Dead, Long Live Schema Design. Okay, so it was provocative a title on purpose. And of course, the message of the article is much more nuanced with the conclusion that data modeling is actually indispensable, but should maybe give it, be given a different name and uh, maybe we should do a few things uh, differently. So, um, you know, I advocated that the conceptual data modeling should be done, uh, but using the principles of domain-driven design, um, and that we could skip directly, uh, we could skip the step of logical modeling and go straight to physical schema design. So before you shoot me for uh, challenging, you know, things that have been done for decades, let me go through the demonstration. So uh, this is based on the book uh, by Eric Evans on uh, domain-driven design, which is a very theoretical book. But there is a uh, the red book to the right-hand side that talks about implementing all of the principles of the blue book. Uh, and that red book is um, is really uh, wonderful in explaining how this whole thing uh, works. The principle is that you should uh, break down complex problems uh, into smaller ones, because the observation of uh, Eric Evans was that um, enterprise software might be might have the most beautiful design to start with when in in its first version but as it grows you know as new features are added um, as the the software goes into the hands of many different people over the course of the, of years it ends up being a big ball of mud uh, to the point that nobody dares to change anything to uh, to the application in fear of breaking uh, 
all kinds of other parts of the application. So that was the observation of Eric Evans that led to domain-driven design, where uh, he advocates to focus uh, efforts of dedicated people uh, on core uh, problems uh, and not reinventing the wheel, about uh, breaking down the complex problem into smaller bounded contexts, uh, you know, smaller problems with uh, a clear uh, perimeter, using the language of the business throughout the whole uh, project and collaborating and doing a lot of modeling uh, of things. I'm not going to go into the details of domain-driven design. We don't have the time here, but I want to talk about the concept of aggregation um, that is developed in domain-driven design. And aggregations, it's actually the reverse of denormalization, uh, of normalization, I'm sorry. Uh, it's the reverse of normalization. And it is a keeping together all of the things that belong together conceptually, okay? And this concept of aggregates, if done uh, at the conceptual uh, step of the, of the process through domain-driven design, leads to um, a storage um, in the data that um, eliminates you know, object impedance mismatch, which is basically something, a, a, a challenge that many developers have had to deal with when doing object-oriented programming, where the data, the way it's stored, is not the way it's be, being manipulated by the application. And through denormalization and uh, uh, access-driven uh, patterns, uh, you know, that are used in NoSQL, we have the ability of storing objects the way they're being manipulated by uh, the developer inside the application. And we have a coherence from analysis through physical storage, where the uh, conceptualization of the problem through domain-driven design can map directly in a coherent manner to the physical schema, the physical design that is going to be stored in the database using NoSQL technology and denormalizing things uh, the way that is not um, really feasible with uh, relational databases. And so I said earlier, you know, don't shoot me, I needed to do a demonstration that you could go from conceptual design using the main driven design, it immediately uh, to physical schema design and generate outputs out of that without going through the step of logical data models if you want to apply the theory of logical uh, data modeling, which is uh, to have things completely normalized and um, uh, technology agnostic. So, Domain-driven design and NoSQL are really made for each other. Okay, so enough of, uh, the, uh, of, of the theory. Let's talk about now the uh, real challenges that, are, uh, that our customers are facing. So the main challenge is that NoSQL is not easy and NoSQL data modeling is not easy either. So uh, despite what the database vendors for NoSQL will tell you, um, yes, it's easy to get into the technology, but the, um, the learning curve is, is actually pretty steep. Um, you, you encounter, um, you, you may encounter situation, um, you may have read about horror stories on the web, the people who are disappointed by such and such uh, database uh, technology, um, and they blame the technology. Actually, they shouldn't blame the technology. The technology is incredibly powerful and, um, uh, and flexible, and that means you need to understand what you're doing rather than going head down into a path and then figure on, figuring out 
later at maybe a very uh, high price that you should have done uh, things differently. Um, in, in effect, um, you know, the rules of normalizations that you find in relational databases provide a guardrail. You know, you have to understand the theory before you start doing things. Um, you have enforcement of um, constraints, you have referential integrity, all of these things that are built in um, the relational database technology. With NoSQL, many of these constraints have been uh, taken out uh, for reasons of performance and flexibility and scalability, all with a good reason. But with all of that flexibility comes a tremendous uh, uh, responsibility because there are no guardrails. Okay, so um, so customers are experiencing this pain of um, having believed early on that everything was going to be easy and then figuring out uh, after a while that it's actually complicated. Let me take a very simple example. It's, you know, it, it's almost a caricature. Um, but if you have a key value pair in a US address structure uh, referencing a state, California here, if you, suddenly have no state information, how should you store it? Should you store it as an empty string? Should you ignore the, uh, the field altogether? Or should you store it as a null? Okay, you can immediately see that, uh, you know, if you store it as a null, so you're going to have um, a, mixed, um, a, a mix of data types, string or null. Um, or, or missing, okay? So, you know, th this is something you could encounter somewhat in relational databases, but the difficulty with JSON is that if, let's say, you decide to not store the information, what is this going to mean for the consuming applications or the consumers of the data uh, downstream? Um, you know, if they, uh, you hear the words uh, schema on read. Okay, so if you do a sampling of the documents and you fetch this one document, you don't see the state appearing. Um, does that mean you can't query on it? Does that mean that it was not applicable, uh, et cetera, et cetera? So how does this uh, how is this going to affect your data quality? How is it going to affect your machine learning or artificial intelligence? So this is from the simple concept of empty missing or null, where we already have such a, a, a complex problem that needs to be resolved. And if you let developers do it their way, they may just say, oh, it doesn't matter, JSON uh, deals with it. But from a government's point of view, from a, a data quality point of view, it may create a problem. I'm not gonna go through uh, the details. I'm just going to list quickly. Um, you know, there's questions about should you uh, reference things and uh, like you would in relational databases or should you embed information? Um, if you have complex data types, should you store them as arrays or as objects? If, um, how deeply uh, should you nest complex structures? Are you using Booleans uh, correctly? Um, you know, are you leveraging the ability to aggregate information in such a way that um, the data can be interpreted by your algorithms? Um, since JSON lets you store things indifferently as strings or numbers, um, you know, how does that affect uh, your applications downstream? Um, I mentioned um, mix, mixing data types. Um, that's also called sometimes uh, polymorphism. Um, you see you can store a number as a number or as a string or as a value within a sub document. Um, you know, one needs to decide what the guidelines are going to be for the programmers to follow 
in order to make sure that uh, things are done correctly. Um, when you're modeling polymorphism, how is that represented uh, visually? Um, and then when you do the reverse engineering, um, is it going to be detected and represented? So all of those are challenges. And the last one I'm going to mention without going into too much detail because time is flying by, um, is that uh, pattern fields uh, is a feature of JSON where the name in a key value pair uh, is not a fixed name, but a variable. And so your consuming systems need to be able, need to be aware of this and deal with them appropriately. So when it comes to access patterns and query driven design of the schemas, um, there you need to apply um, the proper design pattern um, of your schema to the use case uh, that you have to, uh, to deal with. So, um, so all of this is pretty challenging. It all comes from the fact that when you do reverse engineering, you, uh, so uh, let me back up just one second. So there are two use cases. You start from a blank page and you create a model and you have all of the uh, problems I just described. Another use case is you do reverse engineering of an existing production instance. Uh, and when you do this in relational databases, it's pretty simple. You just uh, fetch the DDL and you get all of the information. Of course, you don't have that in most of the SQL, uh, most of the NoSQL databases. You do, you know, for a Hive, you do for a Cassandra, but, uh, but not for uh, many of the other NoSQL databases. So when you do the reverse engineering, you, um, you cannot do um, a full table scan to fetch all of the documents because you might have billions of documents. So what you're going to start with is the sampling of a collection. Um, and hopefully you have a sufficiently large uh, sample uh, data set to be representative of what's going on. Also, uh, if you're using Couchbase or Cosmos DB, for example, you might have all of the different document types that are stored in the same bucket or the same container. And so you need to first determine different groups, um, you know, different document types. And for each document type, um, compile all of the documents and do a probabilistic schema inference, inference of the uh, structure of these documents. So you need to figure out what fields are required, what fields are optional, so what are the different mixed data types or the polymorphism. And um, the, uh, the reverse engineering process needs to be able to figure all of that out. Um, and then finally, um, you have to do this pattern recognition in case uh, in your documents there are uh, fields that um, are of a complex data types, they're successive, and they have names that resemble uh, each other according to a Levenstein distance. So all of this um, process needs to happen during reverse engineering. And at the end, you're going to be um, you're going to be uh, persisting the model uh, on your file system to become a baseline for future comparisons, or is going to be if the data model is going to be enriched uh, with uh, descriptions and constraints, and you're going to produce documentation, maybe feed a data uh, dictionary. Uh, or, uh, you know, a data governance uh, suite with all of that information. So for the last few minutes, I have seven minutes left before we open up um, Q&A. Um, I, I was asked to uh, give my view on the state of the art of uh, NoSQL data modeling tools. 
so you know, given my position, it's a bit difficult not to be biased, right? Uh, so uh, let me just say that you need to use the right tool for the job and uh, tools that may have been around for decades and are, and are very useful and mature for a particular type of technology may not be adapted uh, to the new technologies. When I'm being asked what, uh, who are our biggest competitors, um, my, uh, the number one competitor is the poor practices uh, by, uh, that, that I've talked about earlier. People misinterpreting the term schema-less, they're misinterpreting agile principles, and they say, well, if you wanna, um, if you wanna know the schema uh, of the data, just look it up in the code. Well, many people don't like to look at code. Um, also, if you have multiple applications um, accessing the same data, different consumers, you cannot um, deal with the uh, dynamic schema evolution if everything is documented in one single application. So that that's really our number one competitor. Number two competitor um, is people who um, uh, believe in data modeling, but uh, they, they use pencil and paper, or they use Visio or Word or JSON uh, to do their uh, data modeling. And then, but, but obviously everything that I've just discussed is not, um, is not very, uh, scalable. And so you, if you're in a large company doing large projects, you have to have uh, tools to do the work. Um, I've already talked about earlier uh, what I thought about how these tools handle uh, hierarchical uh, structures or rather how I don't think they handle them correctly, but I let people be the judge, you know, try it with uh, the traditional tools. Um, we think of ourselves, we don't position ourselves as alternatives to these traditional tools. We position ourselves as complement uh, to this, these tools. Uh, most of our customers already have Erwin or Power Designer, Infosphere, ER Studio Architect, and these are great tools. I love them, I myself have been using a power designer for over 20 years. Uh, those tools are absolutely fantastic and they're a great inspiration. They were great for relational databases. When it comes to uh, NoSQL, you need to have a tool that was designed for the 21st century hierarchical and polymorphic data that is found in uh, big data and, uh, and NoSQL databases. So, you know, we've developed the a tool for this. Uh, we think that we can handle all of the different uh, subtleties that I talked about earlier. And, um, you know, I, I want to conclude with the fact that the term schema-less is a misnomer. Uh, even the term schema on read is not exactly, uh, is not accurate. Really, the minute you store data or that you transmit data, it has a schema. So uh, calling it schema-less is uh, misleading. Um, it on, you know, the only thing that is different with the technology on the right, the NoSQL databases uh, versus relational, is that the schema is not enforced by the technology, that you don't have uh, foreign key constraint, uh, referential integrity that are built in uh, the database technology. That means that for in order to reach data quality and good governance, you need to compensate with good practices and logic that may be in the application in order to achieve things like two-phase commits or, uh, or things like that. So it's just a change in power. Uh, you know, instead of relying on the database to do some complex things for you, you may have to do it uh, in a different manner. But um, as we see with our customers, 
it has to be done because the the cost of storing you know billions of records and documents and you know terabytes of information um, is too high if you have no way of leveraging it or if you're leveraging it and uh, the quality is not good enough imagine you know how what in artificial intelligence could be or machine learning if we feed poor um, quality data to these algorithms or um, worse ambiguous data misinterpreted uh, data and so instead of calling this stuff schema less or schema on read i prefer the concept of dynamic schema um, evolution and um, we advocate that uh, data models are necessary and that the objectives of a good uh, NoSQL data model is to uh, achieve the performance that the technology makes available uh, technically, um, that the schema evolution is a great thing in an agile development uh, environment because uh, new features are being added and we move fast, but it should be done in a way um, that is uh, controlled and documented. Um, and uh, so together we can leverage uh, the whole solution and minimize the total cost of ownership. So be careful. Uh, what seems like uh, the easy way, you, if you want to scale NoSQL, data modeling reduces development time, it increases application and data quality, and it lowers execution risk, risks and total uh, ownership. It may seem like a, a harder uh, ra road to the solution, but it always pays off in the end. So um, thank you for your attention. Um, I remind you that uh, we have an academic program which provides free licenses to faculty, staff, and students for educational programs and research. And you're welcome to contact me and apply for it. So that I'm right on time. And we have uh, 15 okay. minutes for questions and answers. Thank you very much, Pascal. It was a very interesting talk. And there are already some questions in the chat. Um, maybe we are about 30 partitions, and maybe it's also possible to open your micro. Colinia, do you like to ask your questions by micro, or should I? Um, yeah, people can ask the, the, their questions live, uh, yeah. frankly. Uh, hi, uh, actually it was model for comments. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's a nice input because I was dealing with issues, many of the issues that you have mentioned on some uh, research that I'm doing. But I think that uh, Ronaldo is placing the, the issue better than I did. So maybe he can be uh, his comment can be explored. So Ronaldo, do you want to speak up? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I just I just put a, a final comment here about the the the, the logical the, the, to skip the logical data design. I I, I wrote in, in the chat that uh, in my opinion, the logical data design it, it really helps to organize the conceptual data model into optimizing data structures in terms of storage and access. So. Uh, it's a, in my opinion, it's a very important uh, uh, step that you cannot skip because you can uh, organize, for example, your your domain into a, a set of intermediate aggregate structure, and then in the physical design, you implement this at, in the several NoSQL data models. I just would like to know your opinion about. Th thank you. So actually, the the debate is often. Uh, due to different interpretations of what logical uh, data design means. And I think that in the case of NoSQL, uh, in practical terms, the difference between logical uh, design and physical design is really, really small. Um, 
the, the only difference is really the data types because the um, the logical so if you take a scheme a physical schema um, with aggregates uh, that is denormalized and you just um, take out the the data types you could have a logical uh, design but some people will argue that that's not uh, good enough that a logical uh, data model should be normal should be fully normalized and so there's debates between uh, people those who say that they that it should be fully normalized would then mean that uh, for a NoSQL design where you have aggregated uh, information, you need to break things up uh, in order to represent them. And I think that these debates are actually not very productive because what matters is having a design that responds to the principles of, um, you know, a application specific query driven design according to access patterns that is what needs to be done in the terms of NoSQL in order to leverage the benefits of the technology so i think that the debates of you know uh, how you get that done is it done through logical uh, data design or through physical directly and uh, and then you just ignore the the data types for for the you know for now just to have the conversation. I I would be comfortable with that. Does that does that make sense? What I just said. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, but I I think that the, the the logical data design can be mixed, in my opinion, to the to the query needs in order to define and intermediate for example aggregate structures i, I know it it's a it's a hard discussion but maybe sometimes it could be he helpful for yeah but design. i actually agree with what you just said i, I uh -huh. think that we're on the same line um i maybe i've done a bit of a caricature to stir things up right <laughs> a, a little <laughs> bit provocative to make people okay. think you know should we do things um, in the same way we've been doing for decades, or because we're not dealing with Agile and NoSQL, we should adjust and uh, be more pragmatic. That, that's really all I was trying to say. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your answer. Okay, there were earlier questions by, by <laughs> Karen Davis, maybe you can. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you very much, this is fascinating. Um, I was wondering, you may have mentioned this and I missed it, but um, I've come across some applications that had highly diverse uh, document structures. So there's, a, I think DBpedia has 24,000 documents and 20,000 schemas. And I was wondering, how do you handle that in reverse engineering when there's so much diversity in, in, the, in the data? Okay, so... I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, DBpedia um, is using uh, semantic graph uh, RDF triples, uh, and we don't deal with it yet. Uh, so there, if I go back, um, hold on, uh, to the families of NoSQL databases, there's key value stores called family documents, and then there's one family called graph. Actually, this graph family should be split in two subfamilies. One of them is labeled property graphs like uh, Neo4j, uh, ArangoDB, which is a, a multimodal uh, uh, Tinkerpop uh, gremlin. That's the labeled property graph uh, side of graphs. And then there's another side, which is uh, the semantic knowledge graphs, uh, you know, RDF triples, OWL, uh, you know, the Sparkle uh, uh, query language. 
And that's a different beast. And with Hackolade, we plan on uh, supporting it in um, early next year, but we don't do yet. So in, the, in that particular case of DBpedia, I, I think that they really have um, uh, linked data um, and it's not, um, you know, entities the, the same way they, they are being defined for more uh, traditional uh, databases. Am I mistaken? Uh, well, I, I guess I, I'd, I'd like to know there's still a lot of polymorphism in JSON. And how, how do you handle it for JSON? Maybe it's okay. not as um, dramatic as the example that I pulled, but right. um, just curious because that's something I've encountered. I, I teach NoSQL in, a, in an advanced database class, and it's really hard to write queries that retrieve the same data. So I'll have 90 students, and they're writing queries that look pretty similar, but they're getting you know wildly different responses <laughs> because of very subtle differences in their queries. So I, I'm just curious. This is a uh, just an interest that I have, and I was wondering how your tool handles it. And I was also wondering, um, is it possible to get an extension beyond the 14-day usage so that I could use it in a class project? So if it's in a class, that means it's for academic uh, purposes, and we extend free licenses to professors and students uh, so very easily. So you just send okay. us uh, a, an email, and, uh, and we'll be happy to accommodate that. Um, but uh, when it comes back to the um, diversity in documents, um, well, obviously, from a data modeling perspective, I think that uh, if the uh, that that if there is a way to make documents uh, that should look alike. Uh, actually look, uh, follow the same structure, I think that is desirable. When we talk about how uh, the, uh, the data scientists are spending all their time, 99% of their time uh, preparing the data, that is not productive. So if you can avoid it from the get-go, I would encourage any company to do that. That being said, you may have diversity of documents uh, and document structures for a good reason. And, um, but let's separate that into two classes. One is you're using Couchbase or Cosmos DB for performance reason, uh, reasons and storage model um, approach of the company uh, providing this, uh, this database technology all of the docu different document types are mixed together. And so basically they have one container, Couchbase calls it one bucket, and you have virtual entities that are in there. So for example, you would have you know, customers, vendors, uh, orders, order details, uh, product information, all in one uh, container. Well, a good uh, practice would be to identify each document uh, with a document type so you could isolate groups of documents within that one container. And if you do that, our tool is able to recognize, uh, you know, you tell it, look, the discriminant to, uh, field is called document type and we will look for different values of the document types and we'll create virtual entities for each of the document types. And within a document type, we assume you know, a pretty harmonious uh, document design per family. But you know, let's say you're, you're in MongoDB, you have a half dozen collections or, you know, Hundred, uh, hundreds of collections, and if you take one collection at a time, you have documents that look different. So when we do um, our, uh, when we do, and where do I have this, uh, our data, uh, our reverse engineering, we will uh, do the sampling, and the sample needs, uh, needs to be 
uh, large enough to be representative. And then we're going to do a probabilistic uh, inference of the schema based on the number of times each field appears in the sample. So if a field appears in 100% of the documents in the sample, we make it a required field. If it's appearing in strictly less than uh, 100%, then it becomes an optional field. And then we can also detect polymorphism um, if a field uh, has multiple data types and it could have one is a, a string, it could be in another document, it's a null, and in yet another document is a substructure. And so we detect that and we uh, represent that in the tool. So but you thank should you. experiment with it. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the last question, there was an interesting question by Bernhard Thalheim, maybe you can tell us. Um, Pascal, I like it very much what you, what you have been saying, but I think we are a little bit spoiled as database people. We think that the schema language is the only language we can use for modeling. In reality, people while programming are also modeling. They express their ideas only in their mind. That means we need better languages uh, to communicate and to extract what they have in their mind, and then we will have the models again. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, and I think that um, the ambition of the uh, semantic web uh, people is to uh, provide that um, universal way of um, linking data and representing how data uh, can be semantically understood by understanding how things are linked together. So, which is why we are very keen on um, developing support for semantic uh, graphs, uh, semantic web and RDF triples, is because it uh, can become a universal language on how to uh, link uh, information throughout the, the world on the internet. Uh, so that, that's my comment. Do you, if you have another one, you know, please share it. I'd love to hear it. No, my problem is only in this case um, that we need uh, beyond semantic web and all these facilities, also some kind of extraction facility uh, to record what people are thinking. I think that's the old documentation problem anyway, but uh, in a similar form, it is also true for models. True, and, um, and I think our tool falls short of that. Uh, we have documentation that is structured um, and it may be too structured to uh, achieve what you have in mind. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks. Thank you. So, thank you. So we are perfect in time. Thank you again for the very interesting talk and thanks to all participants of the first session.